We went there because, uh, on an almost monthly basis, we are learning that children are dying in Border Patrol facilities all along the border, and we're trying to figure out what exactly is going on down there. So we, we sent a team of attorneys, doctors, interpreters to meet with the children and find out about the conditions in which they are being kept. We were not originally planning to go to the Clint Border Facility outside of El Paso, Texas, because it's an adult facility, and the facility uh, historically has had a relatively small occupancy maximum of 104. However, we received reports last week that children appeared to be moving to this facility. And so what we did was we um, added it to our list of visits. And when we got there on Monday morning, we were immediately given a roster showing that there were over 350 children at this facility. And then when we scanned the roster, we were taken aback by the number of very young children at this facility. There were over 100 young children who were being kept there. And so we immediately uh, asked the guards to start to bring us the youngest children and also the children who had been there the longest. We also saw that there were about a half a dozen uh, child mothers and their infants, and so we asked the guards to also bring us those children. When the children walked into the conference room, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. They were sick, they were coughing, they had runny noses, they were filthy dirty, and they immediately started to describe uh, the, the level of hunger that they were experiencing. They told us that they were being fed nothing but the same meals three times a day, and they weren't really meals. These are these are Franken food. These are highly processed chemical foods. In the morning, they are given instant oatmeal, a packet of Kool-Aid, and a cookie. For lunch, they are given instant soup, a cookie, and another packet of Kool-Aid. And then for dinner, they're given a frozen burrito in a plastic wrapper, similar to what you would see at a gas station. And, um, and some of the children complained that the uh, burritos were often not thoroughly cooked. And then they also, at that point, are given another cookie and a Kool-Aid. Young children are being given this meal. Child mothers are being given this meal. And, um, and so the children, on a routine basis, said that they were hungry. On top of that, the children started to describe rooms in which there were 25, 50, uh, 100 children. One boy said that when he first arrived there, there were over 300 children in a room. When we talked to the uh, Border Patrol officers who are running this facility, they reported to us that the facility had recently undergone an expansion, but we couldn't figure out where that expansion was. So after that first day of interviewing, we drove around the facility and we saw a metal warehouse with no walls. And we couldn't believe that that possibly could be the expansion. But when we talked to the Border Patrol officers the next day and started to talk to the children about where they were being kept, we found out that, in fact, that one warehouse was allegedly what had given them an additional capacity of 500 additional children. Um, so then what happened was, as we started to talk about the children, we asked them, who is taking care of you? And we found out that, in fact, nobody's—virtually no one is taking care of these children directly, that they are locked up in these cells 24 hours a day. There are open toilets in many of these cells. There's no soap, no way to wash their hands. They're being fed in these cells, the, the processed instant foods that I described for you earlier. And um, they, many of them are being forced to sleep on concrete because of a shortage of beds and mats and sleeping space. Children describe sleeping on concrete floors. They describe sleeping on cement blocks. Not just the older children, but we heard of infants, toddlers, preschoolers, school-aged children who were having to sleep on the floor. To make things worse, we, we, as we were trying to call in the youngest children, because we were especially concerned about the vulnerabilities of uh, certain elements of this population, we found out that there were a number of children that they could not bring to us because they were so sick. And so we started to count the number of children who apparently were sick at this facility and had been quarantined. And we estimated that at least 15 children that we that we knew about uh, were in quarantine during the time that we were there. And when we uh, finally got access to these children by telephone, we learned about the conditions in these quarantine facilities, which were just horrendous. These very sick children with, uh, with high fevers are being 
put on the floor, on mats, largely unsupervised, locked up together for days at a time. They uh, are bringing, being brought the same foods that are being fed to everybody else at the facility, despite the fact that they're very sick. They also have someone who is coming there uh, twice a day to check their fever and uh, to give them any medications that are needed. But there's nobody really caring for these children in the quarantine areas, despite their severe illness. Now, keep in mind that many of the children who have died in these Border Patrol facilities in re recent months died from, the, from influenza, which is very, very rare in a developed country like the United States. But as you can see, these are not conditions that you would expect to see in the United States. So do you believe some children can die there? Absolutely. And that's why, after the second day of interviewing these children, we called up—we we had a, um, a, a high-level, a high very urgent meeting in my hotel room and said, what are we going to do about this, because somebody is going to die. And so we, we called up the attorneys who are in charge of this case described what we were seeing and then asked them what they wanted us to do about it. And for the first time in over 20 years of doing these visits, they uh, told us to go ahead and go to the media so that we could get these children out of this facility as quickly as possible. Can you talk about the lice and the lice combs? Yes. Yes, yes. So let me tell you about this incident, because this was especially concerning. This visit was really originally scheduled for just three days. And what ended up happening was, when I was there on Wednesday, we started to hear from several children that, that there was an incident that had happened in one of the cells. And what the story was, was that there was a lice outbreak in one of the cells. Six of the children were found to have lice. Those six children were given lice shampoo, um, and then the other children were given two lice combs and told to pass those around and brush their hair with the lice combs in order to make sure that they, too, didn't have lice, or if they did, that the lice were being pulled out by the lice combs. Now, sharing lice combs, we all know, is something you never do with a lice infestation, but this is, in fact, what happened. But then the story gets worse, because one of the little kids lost the comb, and the guards hit the roof. They yelled at the children and berated the children. They scared the children. They made the children cry. And then they took out all of the children's bedding. They took out the mats. They took out the blankets and told them that, as punishment for losing that comb, that they were going to have to sleep on the concrete that night. We could not believe that the guards really were going to do what they had threatened the, to the children that they would do. And so we arranged to come back the next day specifically to interview those children and find out if they had been made to sleep on the floor last night or if it was just an empty threat meant to scare the children. And, in fact, we heard from multiple children that they, in fact, were forced to sleep on the floor that night in this cold cell, you know, on, on the cold concrete.